Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, kind of a gray Saturday here, but we'll uh, hopefully uh, have a good, uh, good maintenance seminar here. And uh, I'm Paul Block. I am the director of maintenance at Thunderbird Aviation Crystal, Thunderbird Aviation um, uh, Fly Cloud, and uh, also run the flight op, uh, maintenance operations for Academy College. So anyways, on our agenda today, I think it got posted. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, talk about inoperative equipment um, and then preventative maintenance sign-offs and also uh, sign-offs for possible inoperative equipment. And then I wanted to do a little quick thing on electronic mags, winter starting, and electronic versus uh, mechanical mags. So I think for the, and then we'll have a question and answer um, at the end. So what I'd like to do first is let's, Go out to the hangar. We're just going to talk a little bit about some things to look for as far as winter operations. So uh, bear with us as we're kind of uh, <laughs> working our way over to the airplane, and then we'll come back into the conference room. So. Where do you want me? Right over on this side, and you can kind of take a picture. Um, so here's a magneto. It's uh, what starts and runs the airplane's uh, engine. I mean, it, this one is a slick. It's it's self-energizing. So it uh, you know self-energizing creates a spark, uh, sends a spark to the uh, 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 spark plugs, and uh, you know you don't have to have any electrical in your airplane. Uh, once you've started the engine, this will maintain the spark. Um, they're old. They uh, they came about basically, you know, their tractors used to have them uh, back in the in the 30s and 40s and, and and later on like that. We we borrowed them in the aviation because because they're self-contained and the batteries and uh, technology were not real good when when airplanes were first designed. Um, so things have changed a little bit now. You know, cars have used electronic ignitions and, and different things that are much more efficient. Well, now our industry is just starting to change and getting into electronic mags. Uh, we have about a thousand hours. This one, this airplane over here, 37 Victor, is the first one, our test bed, for running a electronic mag. Um, uh, the one we chose on this uh, is manufactured by Surefly. Um, you can go check out their website, surefly.com. And uh, I'm going to have Kenny just take a look at it. It looks very similar. You know, it's, it, it, it's self-contained, self-contained unit. Uh, the standard slick wiring harness or Bendix wiring harness. Can you get it in there, Kenny? Where do you want it? Right on the, right in that area there. It's kind of hard. Maybe if you come in from the side there. So that, that blue and silver, that's the Surefly electronic mag, self-contained. Now, this mag does not create its own energy. You do have to hook it up to the power source, the battery on, on the, the ship's battery power. Um, that's the only difference. Um, it's run directly to the battery with uh, uh, a 10 amp inline fuse back by the battery, brings power up to it, and then P lead, which are what you normally hook up to this section on a mag, um, and that's how you run your key, turning it off and on, grounding it and ungrounding it. Um, so it, same operation, uh, the only difference is it's not self-energizing and requires ship's power. And the reason they have it hooked up directly to the battery source, they figure if you have any issues uh, that you need to shut the master uh, solenoid off, your master switch off, you still have battery power that you can run it. Um, and they are also coming up with secondary ones. Right now on, on the inst most installations, it's only approved for one magneto. Um, we opted to use the starting magneto, which um, is an impulse coupled magneto. And look at this. This is what normally, if you don't have an electronic mag or a shower of sparks, this is the magneto. If you listen, sometimes when you turn your prop, you'll hear that click. That's called an impulse coupling. 
And what that does is it retards your timing to just about top dead center. So your, your, your props moving, your props moving, all of a sudden it goes click, spins the magneto really quick, creates a, a spark. We could test it here on Kenny, but I think he'll jump. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding, Kenny. <laughs> he'll be live right now and you put your hand over here and you'll get a pretty good jump, yeah. jump from it. But that impulse coupling, you know, they've worked great for, for many years, but they have issues. Uh, one of the issues is on the slick, slick impulse couplings we found is they've been having manufacturing issues with them and they've been falling apart. Uh, we had one of our arrows where this fell apart, got stuck, broke the gears in the back and it was a disassembly. Luckily the engine still continued to run um, and, and they landed safely. Uh, but the other aspect is this is on the back of the engine and it's submerged with um, splash oil. Now splash oil gets in there in cold temperatures this will actually get um, uh, gummed up. And what you'll hear is when you, you, you move your, your prop, that gummed up oil, uh, you know, you, you can hear it if you carefully pull your prop through, hear that impulse coupling. This one obviously doesn't have it now because it's electronic. It's a very weak snap. Well, you know that that's probably gonna be very difficult in cold operations to get it started. Um, and one of the things I say when you're preheating uh, your aircraft, if you, if you have a, a TANUS or a reef heater, engine block heater, it's not really going to help that situation as much. The, the, the oil in the sump's going to be warm, the cylinders will be warm. But if you grab back on the back of your magneto, the magneto is going to be cold in that area. Some of, the, some of the heat will rise up there, but not a whole lot. So uh, I always tell the guys around here, if they have issues and the impulse coupling seems really sluggish, um, we actually have a forced air heater that we blow up or blow right on top of the, the in our case, the starting mangle left mag. Now we have electronic condition, we don't have to worry about that, but that's something you can, if you're out somewhere, um, it doesn't hurt to pull it through a few times and get that oil, uh, gummed up oil and the impulse coupling snapping a little bit better. Say you're, you, you flew someplace and you got your plugged in, but you're still outside, just run it through carefully. You know, make sure your mags are off, make sure the P lead. I mean, always whenever pulling through an airplane, just remember that it could kick and fire. Um, but that will help you get that snapping because um, that, that's what starts the, the airplane's not gonna start by just cranking. Your, your other magneto, which just spins, will not start the airplane. It needs that quick energy of when the spring lets loose. Um, so that's one aspect of, of winter operations and starting. So we saw the electronic mag. Electronic mags don't require that. They just move, they create their spark, starts right away. Um, the other thing as far as winter ops, which you can also carry on through the rest of the year as far as operations is, if you can see your cowling or lifts open, um, check your primary lines. Uh, really going to be important. Uh, if your fuel injected is different, but uh, uh, carbureted engines are going to have primer lines. They're not on all the cylinders, which is interesting. Why light combing, some of the Continentals will have them on all cylinders. Light combing chose to do, this one's going into cylinder number four. If you look down here, uh, there's nothing on cylinder number uh, two on this one. And then we go over to this side and we'll see a primer line on cylinder number uh, one. And maybe there is one over on the other side, but cylinder number three didn't get one. So you only have a couple, couple, two or three cylinders that are actually getting extra fuel for starters. Um, so you have to kind of remember, uh, <clears throat> especially with uh, uh, aviation uh, 100 low lead, this time of, of year when it's cold out, it evaporates really quickly. Um, so work on what your priming is, you know, and don't prime and, and wait, you know, uh, on your checklist. I, I see a lot of times where people go in there and they prime it, and then they start going through their checklist, and they start turning everything on. Um, I personally, you know, it's the last thing I do. I get everything ready, I prime it, quick turn on of the, uh, of the battery master and start it. 
then do the rescue configuration. Just don't wait so long to prime it and sit there. All that stuff, all that uh, fuel evaporates quickly and, it won't, and your engine won't, won't start. And the other aspect is figure out what prime, how much prime you need. Um, if your engine like uh, three or four primes in, in the summertime, it's probably going to need uh, six to eight primes in, 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 the, uh, in the winter. I mean, it's just, you got to remember, you're not, you're not priming all the cylinders. Usually it's only about three of them. So only three are starting. And then number two, you're on one magneto. Usually it's the left one. And that's only half the spark plugs. Right magneto is not going to fire anything being non impulse coupled. It will try to start, but it, it really can't spin up enough and get enough spark uh, to start it. Now, with electronic mags, they will start. Uh, uh, they don't have an impulse coupling, it's all um, electronically uh, devised. And, and we're finding winter operations, we have most of our fleet uh, converted and, and they're working really well. Working really well. Um, I think the only thing uh, that we have that um, is a little different is hooked up to the ignition switch. When you're switching back and doing your mag check, uh, they shut off really quickly. Uh, you know, there's a lot of dead space in, in the uh, ignition switches. And so when you're moving back and forth doing your mag check, you sometimes get a little backfire if you do it too slowly. Uh, where excess fuel now gets ignited when you're going back and, and, uh, and turning it to both. Um, and so I always tell them, it's like, you know, when you're, when you're going to the mag, it's one thing. When you're coming back to both, I, I tell them to move a little bit quicker. Um, don't be so slow and in between the, the, the indent, uh, uh, indentations on the, on the key. Um, and that helps a lot. Um, but you, you do get a little bit of a backfire. Um, and that's because the mag, when it, when it comes on, it's on. Um, not a slow reacting such as a, a, the old style magneto. So, um, and as far as installation of the electronic mags, uh, pretty simple. I mean, the, the only difficulty is depending on where your battery is. Uh, like on this airplane here, battery is located under the seat. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, we had to string a wire, an extra wire to the battery box and then up into the, into the firewall. It doesn't take a lot of time, but you know, had to kind of go behind one of the side panels. And so that's a little extra work there. Uh, if your battery is located up front in the firewall, excellent. It's right there. Um, really, it's a, it's a quick installation. Um, there's other manufacturers um, that, that have electronic uh, mags. Uh, I've installed one of those before. A lot more clumsy, a lot more components to it, and a, and a more difficult installation. So far, the, the Surefly has really, really been um, um, a great installation um, and, and a good operating uh, magneto. There is a company out there that makes uh, self-energizing electronic mag, but they're not certified yet. Um, and I don't know if the company's ever gonna go certified. We'd hope somebody at some point. Self-energizing, it's kind of a neat idea too. And I've heard a lot of good things about them. Uh, the experimental world is, is using them because they can legally put them on their aircraft. Um, they're a good product. Um, they're self-energizing just like, just like the old fashioned Magneto um, and electronic as far as the distribution of the spark. So, um, but unfortunately for certified airplanes, we're, we're, we're stuck with uh, just one or two uh, uh, manufacturers right, right, right at the time. Uh, Surefly is also getting um, certified to do the second thing, you know. Uh, Cirrus is already that have a dual battery system are using it. Uh, that is, uh, uh, because you have your redundancy of uh, two batteries and a backup battery system, two battery buses. Uh, what they're talking about is it's a little small motorcycle style gel cell battery that only mounted for the other Magneto. Uh, and the battery backup is already approved for avionics and a lot of different things. So they're just finalizing the approval from the FAA to utilize that. Uh, uh, people on the field here, um, 
that I was helping with are putting that in and they're just going to work on getting a field approval. And I think right now that'll, that'll probably fly, um, getting a field approval, but soon it'll be just, a, you know, the 337, everything is all going to be laid out, install it, you're done, and, and the mechanic can sign it off and, and things will be good. Um, it's neat. The electronic mags are bringing our airplanes a little closer to uh, how our cars are operating. Um, these electronic mags, we don't have ours hooked up this way, but they have, they have variable timing um, possibility on there where it works off manifold pressure. So, and it will adjust the timing according to uh, the manifold pressure on that, that, that you're set at it at a given time. So it'll, it'll tweak the, um, the uh, spark advance and uh, or you can have the fixed spark advance that matches your uh, the data plate on your on your engine. So like this data plate is going to be 25 degrees before top dead center. You, you in the front of the mag, I don't have one in stock right now, but right about in this spot, there's a little, it's really simple. It's a little plug. Unscrew the plug and you flip a couple of three or four dip switches into the, the combination that will change the timing on it. So the very universal four cylinder and six cylinder will just run one one style mag will run all the four cylinders uh, either impulse coupling style and that's basically just the depth of it here or the standard uh, uh, sim uh, uh, surefly mag um, it's just really neat really neat idea and so far like I said we probably have about a thousand hours on on uh, three seven Victor over there and no issues um, it one thing nice about electronic mag versus the, the ones that have points and condensers and all these things, these things are really good starting out when they get overhaul. And every time it sparks and is used, all those things start carboning up and wear and the spark diminishes, diminishes, diminishes till your 500 hour inspection where you can go refurbish it again. These things are as good as they were on the start as they are 500 hours, as they are 1,000 hours, assuming that nothing, nothing breaks down in them. Uh, right now, if you go on their website, they say they, after overhaul an engine, they say bring them in and evaluate it. Um, and I don't know what the price is on that. We haven't gotten to that point. Um, and I'll, I'll bring that uh, into one of these maintenance meetings when we actually get to an overhaul and call them up and say, hey, do you, you want to see this? It was working at 2,000 hours. Uh, you want to evaluate it? Uh, I think right now they say, you know, 2,400 hours. I can't remember exactly, but look online, surefly.com. Um, and there's other ones. Check check out other manufacturers, uh, Electro Systems. Um, they have a system. I have put one on and I also removed it. So um, the people that I, I installed it for were not happy with a lot of things, but, you know, they're, you know, I, they're back in business and um, I talked to somebody else and they said they had good, good experience with them. Uh, we want to promote all these, uh, all these outside aviation adventures as much as we can because it's what, it's what promotes, you know, it's a small niche world in aviation and it takes a lot of energy and a lot of money to come up and go outside what we think outside the box for aviation, which is nothing as, as far as the automotive or, or uh, any other industry. Uh, but it took a lot of R&D work. It took a lot of uh, paperwork uh, work trying to get that approved. And, and, you know, thank goodness there's, there's business people that are willing to, uh, to have a love for aviation and to further it to a point where we're not stuck in the 1940s technology for the, you know, you know, next century again, you know, let, let's move forward a little bit safely, but let's move forward. So I think that's all I need to say on starting and, but just there again, just remember, uh, winter operations, denser air, uh, a little more fuel, uh, check your primer lines, make sure they're not leaking. It's always good to do that. Um, using your primers a little bit more and you don't want that squirting around and if something happens just talk to your mechanic um i don't know if it's on the 
I don't think primer line repair would be on the preventative maintenance. We'd have to take a look at the list. So let's go in and continue on with uh, what, we're, uh, what we're talking about as far as inoperative and signing things off and kind of a segue in there. So if you guys can remember, if, if someone has, has signed up uh, for one of my, oh boy, it was maybe three times ago, four, four I don't know when it was, or, or last year at some, or earlier this year, uh, we talked about uh, the preventative maintenance. And where we find the preventative maintenance, uh, I'll write that figure, 43, I don't know how this, 43, FAR 43, and then it's, the appendix, and then it's appendix alpha. So um, I don't know if that got on the handout thing or the list where people look up. I will just uh, briefly uh, pull it up, but definitely look in letter C, it, it talks about all kinds of things in maintenance. Um, uh, major repairs, different things, appliances, all these things, which are going to rely to a, certif a certificated pilot or a mechanic. But you got subcategory C in Appendix A called preventative maintenance. Preventative maintenance is limited to the following work, provided it does not involve complex assembly. And then there's a whole list of things. Um, Removal, installation, and repair of landing gear tires. Uh, replacing elastic shock absorber cords on landing gear. And it goes through, um, uh, let's see here. Replenishing hydraulic fluid in the hydraulic uh, reservoir. There's a lot of in there. Obviously in there, oil change. Uh, removing your, your filter and draining your oil. That, that's a preventative maintenance item. Um, repair of upholstery decorative furnishings in the cabinet cockpit. I mean, it's it's a big, it's a big, it's a big list, and and not everybody's going to be comfortable with it. But maybe you say, hey, you know what? I, I want to start doing my, want to start doing my oil change. Okay, great. You can do it. If you feel comfortable, talk to your mechanic. They'll help you go through it. Figure out how you know. Do your practice on safety wiring the filter, torquing. Get your torque wrenches out. Um, and now you've performed that maintenance, uh, what prevented the maintenance, um, needs a logbook entry. So it's on the list. We can do it. But after we do it, we want to do an entry. All right. So what do we need to have on there? Well, Here's what we do for any type of thing that's not an inspection, which is going to be uh, an inspection would be like annual inspection, progressive inspection, things that that uh, an IA mechanic are going to do uh, fall under the category of uh, 43, 43.9. And that's another FAR. It's interesting how, you know, maintenance is the 43 uh, uh, section of the FARs, CFR 14. Uh, FAR 43, and that's that's all the maintenance items that mechanics look at. So here we got we got FAR 43.9. Okay, that has a fancy thing called content form disposition of maintenance records. Basically, it's stating how do you sign it off, and it's it's how you have to sign it off as far as what the FAA says. So, I mean, in your long book, you know, I see a lot of people different, you know, they don't put it off. They go, oh, I'll change the oil. Well, that, that's fine. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, doesn't really describe a whole lot. Did you change the filter? Did you put a filter on? Did you, what kind of oil did you put in there? I mean, well, I know. Well, yeah, but as far as this, they really want you to the description of the work. So if we look at this, uh, there's different maintenance record ent ent entries except for B. 
Um, and you'll have to look at the different sections uh, on what you're doing. But for most part, what we are doing is going to be here. Description um, of work performed. So we got a description. What's that description going to be? All right. Well, let's say we changed oil. So in there, go through the process. I mean, you could go as far as, this would be one how I would do it. I would say um, drained oil, removed oil filter. It's nice. Uh, we always inspect the media in the oil filter. So I'll say cut open the, uh, uh, the filter or check the media. Uh, no defects noted or no contaminations. I mean, no, there's always metal in there, but no excessive. So that's why I always say no defects noted because you do, you know, when, when people say no metal found, well, really? Engines are always producing metal. Filters will have metal in them. No metal found, no excessive metal found. I usually will say no defects because a bunch of a bunch of metal could possibly be a defect, uh, and that's where you know some of the uh, some of the customers that do, do their oil changes here they save the filter they cut cut it open put it in the baggie and they'll say gee it seems like there's an extra metal and I'll actually track it for them I have a cabinet in there and I'll say yeah let's watch it let's do an oil change early let's just see just because you find a little bit of extra metal one time doesn't mean it's the end of the engine so but you know I don't really like that statement no metal found. But anyway, so there's our description. We, uh, we, we drain the oil, uh, remove filter, check the media in the filter. Um, if you want to pull, there's usually a screen on most engines. Uh, we don't do them at 50 hours. We do them at 100 hours. But maybe every other, uh, you'll have the oil suction screen down there. And that's another media. Pull that screen out and look for bigger chunks that, 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 and, uh, that could be in there, which don't show up in the the filter. So state that. Then what else are you going to do? You're going to install a new filter. Well, let's let's say let's put a part number on there. Okay, so you're, you got your engine takes a, a Tempest oil filter, or or uh, you're putting on a Tempest oil filter, and it's AA48110-2. It's nice to know that part number because if you just say I put an oil filter on there. Well, what if it didn't have the dash two? Not that you're going to find them, but why do, why do these guys have dash two? Um, if you have a champion, why do they have that dash number? Champion would have been just the CH48110-2. Blank. Nothing on there. That's what the old part number was. Well, guess what? They made those in such a way back, and this goes back quite, you know, probably 20 years. They had an issue with how they were making those. And it was such a big deal that an AD came out. So Champion goes, all right, got a dash one. We changed our part number. Now, what if you somebody sold you one and they didn't have the dash one on there? That oil filter, not really good to be on there. It's got an AD on it. Dash one is what Ch Champion did. Uh, Tempest didn't copy the dash one, they just said dash two. Um, and that's 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 how dash two is how they put it on there. But yeah, so I mean, putting the part number on is good. It, it, it shows that you're, you know, you know, other than just oil filter, well, I, yeah, I got this one from, oh, I went and got an O'Reilly's filter. Um, probably not the, uh, Probably not the best idea to do that. It's not uh, not legal. So that's why we, we put our part numbers on when we're making a, a log book entry. All right, so we've done that. We've described our parts. So we changed oil. Uh, inspected. Inspected uh, media. Uh, or medias, depending. Um, installed filter part number. Okay, and uh, you know, champion 
uh, Tempest, a whatever. Um, you can even put in there um, safety because you're going to torque and safety. If there is a torque feature, if you look at the side of the filter, it talks. Filters are really nice. They actually say, look at the, the, the Tempest. I don't know if the Champions, uh, Champion and Tempest are now in the same company owned by Champion. But you'll see on the filter, everybody used to lubricate the O-ring on the oil filter, uh, lubricate it, which is standard. I mean, when you change your, uh, you change your uh, oil in your car, they, they say apply it. If you look now, uh, on the side of it says dry, they don't want it lube. That just changed this last year. Um, so, you know, be, whenever you do stuff, be, be current on what you do. Um, catch these things. I don't think it would be a big deal, but you know what? The manufacturer says, no, don't, uh, don't do that. Uh, don't, don't, put, don't put oil on there. Oil or any DC, uh, I think they used to be DC4 on there is what they used. So they want it dry. Dry, so that means you're going to have the where it screws on. You want to clean that off with a nice, you know, clean rag, and uh, don't put any lube on there. And then it'll have a torque spec, you know. Um, uh, on those, I believe it's going to be 16 to 18 foot pounds. There again, it'll have on what you do. So you might want to put that. On your uh, on your on your uh, description, yeah, I, I I put it on dry like they said. I torqued it into the range of here, um, and then you might even want to say safety it. You say, well, why why would I put this in my logbook entry? Well, what if something were to happen, and uh, you had an engine out somewhere and you lost all the oil? Uh, somebody's going to take a look and go, hmm, well, I mean, it says you changed the oil. Maybe they forgot the safety. Uh, did they torque the oil filter? You know, you want to put as much information that keeps you safe for doing that procedure. And it's not just the fact that you've, you've done an oil change, but these are important things. This is, this is a requirement, a torque to 16 to 18 and put a safety wire on there. So you said, I safety wired it. So we know that in any case, even if the friction from the, from the uh, filter uh, doesn't hold it, safety wire is there so it can't back off. And these are important things because it's how you did it. And if something were to happen, you can go back to the log book and say, you know, uh, John Smith, you said you did your oil change last, and you said, hmm, changed. Oil. Well, okay, what oil did you put in there? Did you change the filter? Did you put a, how much did you service it with? What, what did you do? So, um, so be specific on that entry. So let me make this a little bit here. So on that description, what else are we gonna, what else are we gonna do? Um, after our oil change. So we got the new filter on there. We're gonna service it with our oil. Tell how many quarts you put in. Uh, how many quarts? And that's good for you. You say, well, I always put six in. Okay, so put that in there. And then type. What type of oil are you using? It's always good. Well, I know what type I am. But yeah, but just put the log, put it in your logbook entry too, because maybe somebody on you know, the mechanic, maybe I come in and I'm like, you said, hey, you know. I couldn't get to the last oil change and I look, well, I wonder what oil he's running. I don't see any in the back. I have to call you. This way, I just look at your log books and say, okay, this is what you're doing. This gives me an idea of what, what, what's, the, what's been happening with this airplane. So, um, so type of oil, uh, how many quarts, okay. And then that's pretty much it. You've safety it, you, you've drained it, you've done all that stuff, you put the new oil in and then Another thing which we always do on our logbook entries, you run the engine and it's big check. Verify. Verify, verify, verify. Big check. Um, 
and we put it in there, you verify that that filter's not leaking, the quick drain sealed up properly and isn't leaking. Um, so run it, check it, um, and put that in your description because you did, but what if you don't have it in there and something were to happen? It's like, I seriously, I leak checked it. It's in my logbook entry. Okay, good, good. And everybody's happy about that. I mean, because they're going to wonder if you end up somewhere and have an off-field landing because all your oil's out. Well, where, where did it go? Well, we know it didn't come out of the, you leak checked and it didn't come out of anything you did when you changed it. Um, and so that's the description. Next thing we want to do is, um, <clears throat> got our description, did what our, our maintenance was. Big look at uh, 43.9 again, date. Okay, so description, next, date. Okay, so that's important. Okay, number three. And that is name a person performing a work. Okay, so here's where you, just, you put your name in there, your name, and along with that name, you're going to sign it. And what kind of certificate? So you need to put your certificate number. So, so for me, I would put A and P. And then my AMP number here. Um, I'm a private pilot. Now that this trumps my private pilot, but so if you are a private pilot, then you're going to put private pilot in your certificate number. So PP, private pilot, and then cert number. Um, whatever you hold, and you need to just. Back, just like when we did the preventative maintenance, you can't be just anybody performing maintenance. You have to um, have a certificate, you know, some type of flight certificate doing it. Plus, the other aspect of it, going back to the preventative maintenance, um, yeah. have access and, and permission to do it. Um, so, Thunderbird here, people are renting. They don't have permission to do these things and, and, and to sign anything off. Uh, we don't give permission. That's that's maintenance's responsibility to do that. But when you own your own airplane, or if you're approved by a person that you can do maintenance on their airplane, it's in your responsibility to put your certificate, um, type of certificate, and certificate number down along with your name. Okay. Um, the other thing, and when you sign it. Your signature, you know, that's my signature there. That signature, this is important. More than just your name printed out there. What I always do is I have I have a form, I have a print, I put I print my name. Technically, a signature would be good enough, but if, if it's not recognizable, print your name and then sign it. The signature, if you look at line, I believe it's gonna be uh, line four. Signature constitutes the approval for return to service. Of course, return to service only for the work performed, meaning you're signing that off now that that work that you perform makes that airplane airworthy because of the oil change you just did. You are now responsible for it and you've dated everything, you put everything on there. Now there's something else that usually we do and that is, um, Always nice. If you notice, it didn't really say you had to on here, but we'll go with attack time or some type of, of measuring time on when you did that oil change. Um, it's not required under 43.9, but usually that's what you want to do because you want to kind of say, hey, when, how many hours ago did I do this? Um, when we go and sign things off at 43.11, these inspections, there, I have to go with total time of uh, the component. So that means airframe, airframe total time, uh, engine total time. You can put tag time, you can put other things on there. But right, right now, for 
Tag time would always be good. So you got one, two, three, four point five. And and then you know that that's whatever you got. So that I always always throw that on there. So that pretty much is a is a good entry. Description, date, signature, certificate number, and then it's good to put on a tag time to know what you did. Um, uh, gives you an idea um, of when I mean if you're changing a light bulb, is that really is it really necessary? Probably not. But you're changing the oil, you'd want to know when it was. Um, it, you know that's that's kind of light bulb. You, do you really care? Oh gee, boy, that light bulb lasted 300 hours. Then it's not as necessary, but it doesn't hurt to put it on there. So all right, so that's how we sign off. Sign off when we do preventative maintenance. Right. And and I always look through, go ahead and look through again, and we'll bring up the preventative maintenance list, but uh, go through and look at that appendix, appendix A, um, and then subletter C, preventative maintenance, and look at the things you can do. Uh, but just don't do them and not sign them off. Put them in your log book. I mean, it's great to have that information. You know, or you, you know that you've done that. I mean, some people say, well, it's a hassle. I know that I've done to it. Yeah, but if you ever sell it, it shows that this airplane has been maintained very well. I mean, we know that these things, it gets light bulbs, it gets fasteners, it gets oil changes, a lot of these things. It's like, but then I see log books, uh, uh, guys, that send them to me and I, and I do an annual and I'm like, well, this, this airplane's been around for a while. Boy, it doesn't have many signatures and much maintenance done on it. Was it taken care of? So, I mean, think about it. I mean, it a good maintenance log keeps the value of your airplane. It, 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 people do it all the time with their cars. Oh, look at that. In my glove box, I got all the stuff I've done to it. Well, airplanes, let's do it. Let's do it also. Everything you do, just it shows that you gave PLC to it. So that, that's important, you know? So sign off your work. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about, as far as looking at signing stuff off, is inoperative equipment. I'm just gonna shorten that as inop equipment. So <clears throat> what are the regs say? 91.213. Talks about inoperative equipment. What do you need to do um, to possibly fly an airplane that has something that's not working? And the and the answer to that is first of all, you have to deem whether or not it's an airworthy issue. Is it something I can fly with it out being fixed? Is it something that I can sign off? If I'm not an AMG mechanic, and so it, it gets it. There's a lot to it. The safest answer, if you're not an AMG mechanic, of what you can uh, sign off, is stick with your uh, preventative maintenance. If there's something in there, and, and that's going to be to simple electrical circuits, um, lighting, different things like that something that needs to be repaired on the column because you can do some repair, but it's not airworthy. And, uh, you know, it's missing a fastener, different things like that. Um, so that's the safest answer as far as if it's, if it's something on the preventative maintenance, you can definitely sign it off. If it's not, then you got to investigate a little bit more. Can I fly it? Um, so there again, on signing off for... In operative equipment, it's going to be very similar to um, uh, performing maintenance. The difference is when you sign it off, you've verified that the system is deactivated. So, if it, say it's a light and you don't need it for VFR, VFR flying, you know, um, you know, it's a landing light. Well, technically, a landing light you don't need for uh, for night flight either. But say it's VFR day. Um, and that landing light is out. Well, should placard it. I mean, it's part of 91213. You say, hey, it's not working. Um, you know, you can 
hey, I was working before I took off. Uh, that's a lot of times what I hear pilots say. They don't want a placard. Oh, okay, so now you did that and you land somewhere and you're going on a three-point trip. Are you going to keep on saying, yeah, I was working all I, when I took off? It's like, mm, maybe take a little piece of tape and placard it. It automatically is deactivated itself. It's burnt out. So uh, what we do is we make a placard. That's simple. You put something, a piece of tape, you put it on a, you know, if you're at, if you're at your home office, hmm, right now, flight, inoperative, little sticky tape, pull it in the back there, put it in front there. Right now, flight, inoperative, burnt out, didn't have a chance. Now, something, if you have time, change it. It's on the preventative maintenance list. But if it's not working, you should placard it. And so you place a plaque on it right now, line it up again. And then, and there again, a logbook entry goes along with it. And in there, you're gonna do what again? D. Description, okay. So there, on the description, you're gonna, you're going to uh, do what you did. Well, I play, put a plaque card in view of the, of the, of the pilot. Um, you can, you know, on the deactivate, um, it deactivated itself. So, you know, by burning out, um, it's not going to create any hazard. So that's the main thing you want to make sure is anything that you're placarding, even if it's on the preventative, is it something that could cause a problem um, uh, or, or be a problem, not just not working, but with it not working, is there a safety issue? So you have to make that decision, take a look at that. Um, and then there again, sign it. And uh, it's not bad. I, you know, I always say, put at least a back time on there. Just always good. Um, not to have to have a full time airframe. But same thing, um, placard, post it, description. So this is your log of entry. Okay, so that is uh, very clear. We know if it's inoperative and it's on a preventative maintenance list. Now what happens, and we'll get into this a little bit, what about, uh, let's say we got, something and it's not on the preventative maintenance list. And so you call your mechanic and say, all right, it's not on the preventative maintenance list. Um, you know, and you guys kind of kick it over. Is that something that is gonna be needed for the safety of, of um, let's say a, it's a, your attitude indicator is tumble. Can you lacquer that? Um, you can't replace your gyroscopic instrument. Um, so you have to kind of make that decision. Is that something you saw it tumbling? Do you deactivate a tumbling gyroscopic instrument? No, you don't. You can't. You just cover it up or put a sticker on there. So there you might want to call your mechanic and say, hey, I mean, this isn't on that list, but I don't need it. I'm flying day VFR. I don't need an attitude indicator. And I, I'm over in... Uh, you know, Wisconsin, and I got to fly back to you here at, at, at Crystal, so um, I don't want to go and replace that. Okay, so placard. Um, talk to him, and he says, yeah, not a problem. Yeah, that's deactivated itself. So then you can probably put a placard on yourself, fly back, right? instead of not doing anything at all. Um, what if, hmm, let's think about this one. Your trim gets stuck on your, on your elevator trim, it's just really stiff and it's stuck. It's in a neutral position. Um, is that is that something that could be placarded, even inspected by a, a mechanic and placarded at the field there, and then you fly it home? Um, is it required? Is it on the list? Uh, if we look at 91205, JVFR, it doesn't talk about that. So then you go to the POH or or the type certificate data sheet for the airplane. Is that required equipment? And you go, oh, I don't see, I don't see the trim on there as 
as required equipment. So is that, is that, oh, I must be able to placard it then and not use it. It's like, well, how are you gonna placard it? Under what reg are you gonna use? If you look at 91 to 13, and if we see what it says in there, um, operations without an approved uh, um, um, uh, MEL allows an aircraft with inoperative instruments or equipment, and there as long as it's you know safety of flight, different things like that. Well, what about your trim? Is that equipment? What do you think the FAA would say? Well. Die. They've made rulings on this. And this is where you have to kind of really be careful about how you fly it. Um, your choices are you get a special um, a ferry permit to get it back, um, placard it, because, oh, I've flown that. I mean, it'll fly just fine. It flaps up, safe, flaps are up. Um, so I could placard it and fly it back or fix it. You know, you got those three, three options there. Well, Fixing is an option, but let's just say nobody's on the field and they can help you out. So then, do I have to ferry it back or can I legally fly, fly it back? And the answer is on this one, and I, I, I just kind of started thinking about some of these items. If you look at trim, trim is a secondary control. It's not on the equipment list. It's not an equipment item. It's not an instrument item. So at that point, the FAA's ruling on this would be, no, you're gonna have to ferry it back. Inspect it by a mechanic, get a ferry permit, fly it back, which isn't the end of the world. Ferry permits, they give you a, they give you a, a window of opportunity when you get, when you get, you know, they fax it back to you. You have like eight days or 10 days to, to fly it, a window of operation to fly it back. Yes, not a big deal. Flaps are up, it's stuck, or I mean, we're talking about uh, trim. Trim is in the neutral position, you know you can fly. You don't have to adjust that much. Um, it should be safe to fly it back. Um, mechanic goes, yeah, I heard the average, you know. So you got a little bit of pressure to trim it out. But you're in the neutral. It's not like going to give you any adverse effect. Um, the same thing with flaps. Flaps are a secondary control service. Flaps are stuck up. They won't come down. And But you're going to need to have a ferry permit. Um, so there is something there. you got to figure out where the list is coming from. Um, no, it's not. You don't see it anywhere on the equipment list or anything like that. So it must be safe. It must be something you can do. Well, it's not an equipment list. It's a secondary control surface. It's part of the airplane. So you look at 91.213, it's inoperative instruments or equipment. Equipment is that list you see in the POH where it's how the plane came with. Uh, you know, I had these cool lights on it, it had this radio stack in there, it had, you know, I had this piece of equipment here, but it's not the structure of the airplane. Uh, secondary control is a structure of an airplane. It would be like saying, you know, primary control. Eh, can I fly back? The aileron's off, you know? No, that's primary control. Can't do that. It's part of, like flying it without a wing. Um, that's how the viewpoint is. So you just got to be careful about certain things. Just don't assume. And, and the reason I, I bring these things up to people is a lot of times I, I see people that are going, oh, I think I can fly it, it'll be fine. I'm just gonna fly it back. Yeah, yeah, that's an option. But what if something were to happen? And you broke an FAR, um, you know, the FAA is gonna slap you, especially if, you know, just a little slapping, especially if nothing really bad happened, you might get a suspension. But what if it happened and the, your insurance company got a hold of it? They're not going to insure your airplane. They're going to say, eh, you just self insured, buddy. You know, you're a $50,000 airplane. Yeah, we're not paying for it. Yeah, you, you ended up in a field, you ended up on Highway 81, whatever, and you clipped a wing. Uh, nah, you should have been flying that thing. Um, and we're not going to cover you because you, you bust the ring. So, you know, it's something to think about being, you know, being legitimate in all the things that you do as far as uh, paperwork along with flying, you know, being safe. 
But you say, well, that's not a safety thing. I've told this all the time. Yes, but it's signed off properly. Because the other half of it is if something were to happen, you know, you're legal, you're the pilot command, you're the one that's responsible for making sure that everything's signed off. Not your mechanic, you as the operator of that airplane. Um, they come after you saying, well, I'm not a mechanic, so it'd be okay. Well, okay. They, they don't go with that. They go, well, what do you know? You know? So, um, something to think about. Um, and uh, let's see here. Just want to make sure inoperative sign offs, placards, preventative maintenance, electronic. We've covered everything. Um, let's uh, have an open uh, question and answer uh, time before we end. Anybody have any questions? See. Kenny's um, trying to get the sound on here, guys. So tire tubes. Tire tubes. Can you, you guys can if yeah, one of you we, wants we to got, unmute. Yeah. Just just speak. We got you unmuted or unmute yourself. Hey Paul, Paul works from here. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi Paul. Hey, where does the placard go? Is it in the airplane or in the logbook? The placard goes in the airplane, the sign-off goes in the logbook. When you say the sign off for the sign off for the defective equipment? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And that's something interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you're on here because I was just thinking about it. You guys have uh, a, a squawk list in your uh, you know, the database when somebody so somebody knows when something's in there. You know, technically, how does that work out? Because uh, Club Cherokee is the same way. You know, it shows up as oh, this isn't working, this isn't working, and so you guys have a a, a squawk know, list in your system. Yep. But the item doesn't necessarily have a placard on it. Right. You know. Now, even if it's not for the safety of flight, technically, legally, should be placarded and and, and signed off. You know, by by the person you know lights it off. You know, so that that's you know, so you're tracking it one way, but you're right, it probably should have a little piece of tape saying, hey, you know what, right now light's not working. So the next person, just in case, didn't read the stuff in the in the in there, they don't get themselves into a situation. Right now, light's not up, you know, not working, you know. Didn't get a chance to change it out yet. Right. So yes, right. It uh, placards need to be in front of the pilot. Pilot in command, you know, so they can see it and know that that equipment isn't working the defect needs to be logged in the logbook is that what you're saying well so it should be yes it should be but at okay. least at least in this case for you you know people aren't going to have access to those logbooks at least to the point where at least it's signed off and placarded you know and then when you guys sign up and get it fixed um then it can be um signed off in a logbook uh by somebody if you change the light bulb on it or if you send it over to me and i you know i fix it but it should be at least placarded you know the regs would like to see the logbooks but you know your guys aren't going to have access to the logbook so that's not as not as important as the fact that it does get the placard notifying the the next pilot that that piece of um, item is inoperative I agree. So the placard, yeah, we do that, but uh, we have an operational squawk list in our scheduler. Yeah. So we use that for broader notification. Right. And, 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 and to be honest with you, are you going to, you know, a screw fell out of the, uh, out of a door panel. You're not going to placard that, that screw's missing. I mean, it's, you know, it's like a fastener on the, on the colony. You guys will probably put that in there. But is are you going to put a placard on the on the, on the uh, you know how many fasteners you know there, there's a percentage of fasteners that could be missing you know uh, and still be safe given mm -hmm. uh, airplane you know so you can notify that in there you're not going to be placarding the uh, you know the fastener missing that will be on your your sheet but when it's something like you know this uh, you know the the landing lights out the nav lights out something like that should be on there or re recog light right recog light is out that that should be in there. People should yep. know more so than just 
in your in your uh, planning sheet? So, you know, I just changed oil in our lance this morning. Mm -hmm. Did you do a logbook entry? Yes, I did. And, you know, your points about the logbook entry were well taken, especially around no defects noted. I had written in there, no metal contaminants found. So I've learned something. I always hate that. I hate that one. I hate you that when I see mechanics and people do that one because you tell me when you cut that open, a normal filter has metal in it. It's just, yep. it's just the sheer nature of machineries that are reciprocating. So what you're saying is no metal found, no, no excessive metal found. Exactly. Um, yeah. So that's why I could've... was like no defects noted or something on that line because it's not a defect. It's normal operation. Specifying yep. that that filter looked normal. You should you know, have had. When this... you see a fleck of something in there, that's normal. When you see a pile of it in there, now we got a problem. Yeah. You know? So that thing, you know, it's, it's my little pet peeve. You know, it's like I, I like to be a little more literal. You know, no metal found. It's like, yeah, really? <laughs> you know. Hmm. Well, you, uh, you, you Paul, I'd you like should to see that filter. Let me rinse it out for you. <laughs> hey, Paul, you should have had this webinar yeah. last week, so I wouldn't have written it that way. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. So, well, you, you can go change it. <laughs> so we have a couple in the chat. Okay. Um. See, so Paul Babbler wants to know, can student pilots do their own preventive maintenance or only after they get their PPL? Oh, that's a good one. I don't think they can. Um, let me look at, uh, look at the regs here real quick. Um, do, 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 do. Where do we got? Uh, These, the holder of at least a private pilot certificate issued under 61, who is the registered owner, including co-owners of the affected aircraft, and who holds a certificate of competency for the aircraft, affected aircraft issued by a school or approved, you know, so yeah, it's going to be, no, not a student, not a student pilot. Okay, and then... Let's see here. Um, Stephen Troll wants to know, um, can you replace your own tire tubes? Yes, yes. Let's go back to the list there. Do, 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 do. All right. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Removal, institution, and repair of landing gear tires. And while you're doing it, servicing landing gear wheel bearings, such as cleaning and greasing. So when you do that and have that wheel apart, um, it would be a good idea to do the, uh, do the bearings at the same time, or at least check them, clean them. So yes. And make sure anytime that you're doing something, yes, you're replacing your tube. Uh, there's going to be three to six bolts holding that, that rim together, split rim. Make sure you know what you're doing. Are you just putting it together and just, you know, taking your old uh, wrench and tightening them down to what, what you, you need to? Most rims will have a torque. Make sure you do it right. Make sure you torque it right. Make sure you, you know what you're doing on it before you do it. Um, and that's, that's the thing. To anything in maintenance, it, it goes to an EMP mechanic to preventative maintenance, and that is, if we don't know the process and we can't figure out the process from um, the manual or anything like that, we need to have someone who's done that help us out and perform that maintenance with us before we, you know, something we've never done before and there's not anything that specifies it, you just don't shoot at the hip on it. 
So, but yes, you can do your own tubes. And then Paul wants to know, my Zoom wasn't recording. What was a section of FAR for preventive maintenance, maintenance list? It is 43, Appendix A, and then it goes to the subcategory C, small c in parentheses. So I'll go to Appendix A of 43. You'll see A is major repairs. Uh, B is uh, our major alterations. B is major repairs. And then C is preventative maintenance. Down, uh, you know, probably a page and a half in. And continues the, it's the, it's the last subcategory, I believe. Yep. Before Appendix B. Is that it, guys? Any, anything else? Any other questions? Yeah, there's one more, it looks like. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Stephen asked, uh, can a private pilot replace the ELT battery if the 24 month does not align with the annual? Nope, because it's going to it's going to require we'd have to go to look at that real quick let me sit down on this one um i know that most people are capable of it and i know people do it but let's take a look at what's on the let's look at our appendix in this case it's really interesting um, that's a that's a really good question. Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, you know, and and replacing and servicing batteries is in the list. Uh, but then let's look at ninety one two oh seven as far as the testing. Um, I don't know. We look at 91207D is, is the battery corrosion, proper installation, operations of the crash sensor, all these things. And by replacing the battery, you're pulling the whole thing apart. Um, my feeling is no. I would say even though, I mean, if they specified replacing ELT batteries in appendix uh, alpha, uh, they talk about batteries. You can do the ship's battery. Um, other batteries, uh, replacing the servicing batteries. Um, Yeah, I no. It's a, that that's one where I would probably defer to you, um, legally. No, I really I, I I don't see something there because how do you by just replacing that battery? How do you know you've changed the possible operation of that unit? So how do you test it? And is that testing allowed under two hundred seven? or in Appendix A. And even though battery replacement, I still think that you would have to, you know, yeah. But you could, I mean, the, the, the new 401, uh, uh, the new uh, 406 ELTs, 
they ping and do their own to self test too. So um, I don't know. That's a tough one. That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I I don't have an answer on that one. Don't have an answer. There's one more. It looks like um, if a pilot is rated in one category of aircraft, may he she perform allowed maintenance on uh, as aircraft in which he she is not rated. So they're rated in an airplane. Can they perform preventive maintenance on one they're not rated in? Let's go back to that appendix where we read what. Do they own it? But they can't fly it. I would assume so in this case, yeah. Mm -hmm. You own an airplane that you're not rated in. Can you perform better maintenance? Holds a certificate of competency for the, so in other words, you need to be rated in that aircraft. So you gotta have a sign off, check out, you know, whatever. You, yeah. Yeah. So no, cannot do it. I think that's it, unless you guys have any more. Paul said, thanks for your help. Mm -hmm.